So there's the skin and then there's the mucosa. Those are the really two physical barriers that we have. And I wanted to, to take some time to divulge and talk about each and every one of them. First things first, I'll discuss the skin in blue. So both your skin and your mucosal tissue have lots of normal healthy bacteria, sometimes called normal flora or microbiota, whatever you want to call it. They're all the same thing. And what this is, is this is good bacteria and uh, symbiotic yeast and other protozoans that are good and competition for pathogenic ones. They keep the pathogenic bacteria in check. Not just in terms of resources, but it's in sort of terms of selective competition. Um, the other thing that the skin has that uh, helps it really good from protecting us from other foreign invaders and pathogens is that it is a very acidic compound. Um, I just now realized this, but apparently face lotion and hand lotion and body lotion are actually three different things. I'm a guy, so give me a break. Uh, but the reason that you do that is because the pH is supposedly different on your face than it is on your arms or something. And so uh, this acidity can be anywhere between, I've heard, four to five. But either way, that's really good at inhibiting bacterial growth. The thing that we have on our skin that protects us, it'd be uh, something called sebum. And this is just a fancy scientific word for just saying oils. Um, if your skin is oily, um, this uh, can actually protect us from pathogens. Um, I'm not really a big fan of cleaning things with alcohol if you have an infection in your skin because alcohol will dehydrate. Uh, it's a dehydrant. It'll absorb all the oils from your skin. So sebum um, containing both oils lipids and, uh, I'll just draw it down here, specifically fatty acids are good at destroying and disrupting uh, bacterial growth. Another thing that you'll see on skin that we have that protects us is our sweat. What are the two constituents of sweat? Well, we have salt. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but salt is not good uh, for bacterial growth. It's good at inhibiting them. That's why you put salt in water if you have a sore throat, which I've been doing lately today because I have had a sore throat. But it also contains something called dermicidins. I don't know how well you can see that. I'm going to go ahead and just circle it here if I can. So if it ends in IN, you know that it's a protein, and this is an antimicrobial protein that's found in sweat. And the next thing, I will I'll do this in purple or magenta, whatever color you want to imagine it. But I should have done this, I'll just go ahead and draw it like this to encompass the normal flora too. This is These are things that they kind of have in common. Obviously there's not going to be acidic contents of your mucosa or of your uh, <laughs> sebum in your mucosa, but, but both the skin and the mucosa contain um, certain antimicrobial proteins called defensins. Men's in an IN, you know it's a protein. These are um, proteins that rupture the membranes of pathogens. And then the other one that they have is uh, called lactoferrin. The word fer, like ferrous, meaning iron. So uh, I'll just go ahead and draw what each and every one of these do over here. So lactoferrin blocks iron metabolism in pathogens. So if uh, you've ever had a really bad stomach ache, one of the things that you'll do if you have a stomach ache is to go on a clear liquid diet. That's a really good way to, to clear up whatever it is, bug that's bothering you. And the reason that that works is because if you're really essentially doing nothing but drinking broth or uh, uh, Gatorade and you're not eating actual meat particularly, you're not getting iron in your body. And iron is a, one of the most important cations for all biological systems to react. And, and you can conserve yours, but pathogens and bacteria, specifically in your intestine, can't live long without them. And the fencins, I think I said this already, but I'll just go ahead and rewrite it, that they rupture membranes. They rupture your plasma membrane of your pathogens that you have. And both our skin and our mucosa have normal flora, and then the defensins and the lactoferrin. Um, and before I even give in, divulge into the mucosa, I want to say that both the mucosa and your skin, not really so much mucosal, the mucus itself, but the epithelial tissue, and obviously your skin itself, has really strong, tight junctions. These are really powerful connective proteins that are linking one cell to the other. That's why it's a barrier that I'm talking about in the first place. That's why your skin doesn't just fall off whenever you, you know, take a tumble, you know, when you're running. Not that that's ever happened to me, but uh, these tight junctions are so powerful that the only really way the uh, pathogen can get through them is to damage the tissue itself, which makes sense, right? The only way that a pathogen can get into my body through my skin would be to tear it open. 
So that's just something that you may want to keep in mind. But for the uh, mucosa, you really have two different types. There's the respiratory system and then there's the GI tract. And both of these are very, very similar. They both have normal flora in them. Yeah, even in your respiratory tract. Um, but obviously there are things about the GI tract that help keep them different. So I'm going to go ahead and draw some analogies here like this. And you'll know what I mean later. So our GI tract has all of this associated stuff here. Defensins, lactoferrin, normal foro that I've distinguished in the mucosa. But specifically for our GI tract, we have hydrochloric acid. That's what's in your stomach that breaks down your food. But it also kills bacteria. It's hydrochloric acid. That's the stuff from the movie Alien. Uh, and uh, other types of really digestive enzymes, but they don't really care. If there's a protein there, they're going to break it down. Uh, proteases do just that. They break down proteins. Um, and then also in your GI tract, we have things that are involved with movement. Okay, so this applies both to respiratory and GI tract. For the GI, the movement would be the peristalsis, which is basically just smooth muscle contractions, which just help flushes thing through your intestine. I don't know if you know this, but the reason that dogs can really essentially eat rotting possum ass but not die is because they're the peristalsic, uh, peristaltic contractions of their in intestine is so fast that the rotting flesh goes in and out of them so fast that bacteria can't set up, set up shop. I that, thought that, that was interesting. Unfortunately for us, we, we don't have that luxury. We, we can't eat rotting flesh. But in the respiratory tract, we have cilia. So for the movement, I'll go ahead and just say that there's spare peristalsis. This is for your GI. And then for the respiratory, we have these things called cilia. And uh, what that is, is it's long, period, uh, long pieces of ciliary bodies that are kind of acting like crowd surfers. I have a picture in the next slide. I'll show you that. Um, but that's the, those are the two main things that I really wanted to stress here. So let's, so let's look at some pictures. So here's a diagram of the mucosal tissue. So uh, kind of imagine it like... Oh, I don't know, crowd surfing. So this is a bacteria. I'm drawing it like a person. But imagine it like crowd surfing. These cilia all contract. They have long filaments here of, you know, basically uh, analogous to uh, microtubule filaments arranged in a pretty much a similar fashion to what you see with uh, sperm cell flagella moving the pathogen this way. And in this context, this is moving up towards from the lungs here. So looks like a controller for a PlayStation, but anyways, that's the exit area. There's your lungs, and then there's your mouth. So we're going to move this thing up here, and you're either going to cough it out or you're going to swallow it. You do this 10,000 times a day. I know it's kind of gross, but you do. So goblet cells are secreting mucus, and mucus as well acts as a really good physical barrier. I don't think I mentioned that in the last one. Shame on me for not. But imagine which would be easier for you running on water or running on land? Well, obviously, if I'm running on water, muddy water, I'm going to move slower. The same thing applies to bacteria. It's a really strong physical barrier and blocks them from getting to where they need to go, which is why if you ever get a cold or a respiratory infection, your body starts to increase mucus production because they say, all right, enough is enough. None of more, no more crap is getting in, and it starts producing that stuff out the wazoo. It's made by goblet cells, which apparently are supposed to look like goblets themselves, like Harry Potter, Goblet of Fire. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that connection there. But anyways, tight junctions, uh, again, only way that a pathogen can get through that would be to actually kill them themselves. Yeah, and also, mucosal tissue, mostly just the GI tract, but tend to have a lot more... Uh, symbiotic bacteria than your skin does. Okay, so here's a diagram of the skin. Just showing you the pictures. We have the epidermis and then the dermis here. It's obviously it's vascular. Uh, and there's other stuff that we're not mentioning here. Um, certain stationary dendritic macrophages and stuff like that. But um, also something that I didn't mention was that every new week or a couple of weeks or so, you get a new layer of skin. <laughs> and that's really good because that way, imagine if every week or so, your house got demolished, that would make it kind of hard for you to live. And so the same thing is happening in, with your skin, and that's one of the ways that we can protect ourselves from pathogens. 
Um, and then there's a lot of symbiotic yeast here. Uh, keratinized dead cells are pretty strong. There's really nothing in them that they can eat. They're essentially just bags of, of keratin. Again, tight junctions, and the only way that they can get through would be to, uh, really, it would be to, to tear through the tissue. Uh, sebaceous glands secreting to toxic fatty acids, and our sweat glands secreting uh, sodium chloride, and I didn't mention lysozyme either. So lysozyme is something that uh, is an enzyme, and I'll go ahead and discuss it up here, found in both the sweat and in your saliva. There's a lot of stuff in your saliva that we'll start talking about when we talk about uh, the adaptive and immune system. There's actually antibodies in your saliva. But in your sweat and your saliva, there's this enzyme called lysozyme. And what this does is this breaks, that's what the word lys means, to break, like Lysol. The cell wall bacteria, that peptidoglycan, that's one of the things that they're going to go after and they're going to break it down. So, a dog's mouth is actually cleaner than a human's. Why? Because they have more lysozyme and antibodies, but I'm not talking about that because that's an adaptive immune trait, but they have more, and more lysozyme in their saliva per fluid ounce than I do. Kind of gross when you think about it, but that actually is true.